Yes. You can Fine. you you can see me. Now, I right? can see you. I can hear you. Good. Good evening, everyone. And a very, very warm welcome to each and every one of you. Uh, I request everyone to keep their audio on mute because mm -hmm. our programs mm -hmm. are recorded. Redmi Note 11, kindly mute yourself. Okay, so a very warm welcome. It's a rainy, cold day outside, but this will really keep you warm, this talk. We're extremely happy that we have with us Vishy Keval Ramani. He has spoken earlier, and we're glad that he's back again to speak about the Upanishads. We start today's program with the school prayer by Deepti. Over to Deepti. Deepti? Can't hear. Okay, Ramesh, will you say the school prayer? Yes, Okay. Oh, hidden life, vibrant in every atom. Oh, hidden light, shining in all creatures. Oh, hidden love, embracing all in oneness. May each one himself as one with thee know he is also one with every other. Thank you. And now, Deepti, I request you to kindly introduce Rishi. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh... Deepti? Is Deepti there or not? Ramesh, will you introduce uh, our speaker? Sure, Sanjini. Yeah. Well, a very warm welcome to Rishi Kevala Ramani Ji. Um, Rishi Kevala Ramani is a Vedanta lecturer and a corporate motivational speaker. So he's a disciple of the world-renowned spiritual gurus like Sri Satya Sai, Swami Ch Chinmayananda, Swami Parthasarathi, Swami Tejo Mayananda, and Swami Sad Swarupananda. Rishi has spent more than two decades in the study and research of Vedanta. He has had a first-class academic record in management and has had a distinguished management career, which he relinquished to devote himself full-time to a re -present a presentation of Vedanta for, for the modern generation. <clears throat> he has founded the Vedanta Wisdom Institute, a registered non-profit organization dedicated to the dissemination of Vedanta. Rishi teaches the Vedantic texts to the general public, speaking at many academic, social, and business settings, both at home and abroad. He delivers talks on a variety of topics in the field of spirituality, human values, management, and science and philosophy. We're really looking forward to hearing Rishi Ji today. Over to you, Rishi. Thank you so much, Ramesh. Now it's over to you, Rishi. All right, all right. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. It's wonderful having this uh, time with you all. Uh, I'm, I'm audible, right? Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay, okay. All right, so we'll, we'll start with uh, <clears throat> invoking God's grace, uh, chanting Om and uh, Om Sahana Bhavatu, so you can please join in. Oh. 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 Om Shri Ganeshaya Namaha. Om Shri Saraswatiye Namaha. Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha. <coughs> Om Sahana Bhavatu. Sahana Bhunatu. Sahaviryam Karavavahai. 
ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವದೀತಮಸ್ತುಮಾವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 So hari om and uh, my humble greetings to one and all I would request you all to silence your mobiles because this is going to be a very enlightening and uplifting talk it's on the highest subject that is the upanishads so it is in your benefit that if you know uh, give your full attention to this talk my only positive fear is and and it's a positive fear and i hope it comes true uh if if i may ask sajni ji or swati ji how many people are attending uh, i don't have the monitor close to me 24 okay great we are 24 at the moment wonderful i just hope there are 24 buddhas that come out at the end of this talk that's my only prayer uh, now <clears throat> the topic of the day is the main and powerful message of all the upanishads right the message in all the upanishads is the same it's exactly the same there's no difference it's just that different upanishads present the same truth in different ways different perspectives different angles that's about all so the point is the depth matters and not the length you can go through as many upanishads but if you go deep into even one nay even even one mantra and you understand it deeply you understood all the upanishads we will uh i, I believe somebody is uh uh loudspeaker is on um, kindly keep your phone on silent we can hear that i request you to kindly mute your speaker thank you yeah so we'll take up one potent mantra which has it all and the great mahatma gandhi he said that if all hinduism were to disappear and only if this one mantra would remain nay even if even if the first line of this one mantra would remain the whole of hinduism would be retained and what we are talking about today is the first mantra of the isha vasya upanishad it's a very potent mantra and it has got everything the whole vedanta the the whole of spirituality is embedded in this one mantra now upanishads to just give you an introduction about upanishads upanishads or uh, upanishad is not the name of any one particular book the very meaning of upanishads is the knowledge of god or the knowledge of your higher self the knowledge of reality that's the meaning of upanishads it's a scientific exposition of the ultimate truths of life and it's so scientifically presented backed by chest reason and logic now more often than not all the upanishads it starts off by a qualified student an experienced student of life a mature student of life he goes to the enlightened master he puts in a lot of effort and he goes to the enlightened master to ask about what is the reality behind this universe and when we say he's qualified he's experienced he's matured what he mean what we mean is that he's understood that this world cannot give us ultimate peace and happiness 
At most, it can give us fleeting pleasures. No doubt, there are fleeting pleasures in the world. We all enjoy them. But no sooner they come, they're gone. And every pleasure is accompanied with sorrow. Because this world is a pair of opposites. Joy and sorrow. Honor and dishonor. Pain and pleasure. So he, uh, this, this qualified mature student of life understand that he understands that he cannot get ultimate peace and happiness from this world. Moreover, he understands that this mind of ours is insatiable. How many ever desires you fulfill, the mind will have it all and ask for more. And it's never ending. <clears throat> That's why our mind is compared to fire. You know, fire, you put in logs and logs of wood, it consumes it all and it says, give me more. Ye dil mange more, right? So, this qualified, mature student of life understands that the mind cannot be satisfied. It's insatiable. You see, you go to the most powerful man in the world and you go and ask him, sir, are you happy with your power? You're the most powerful man. You know what will he say? It's fine. It's all right. But I wouldn't mind a little more power. You go to the most richest man in the world. You go to Elon Musk. You go to the, the owner of Amazon. And you ask them, sir, are you happy with your wealth? And they will openly declare, well, it's, it's fine. But we wouldn't mind another million or another billion more. You go and ask the most beautiful person. The most handsome person. Are you happy with your beauty? With your physique? And they'll say, no, we want more. So this student of life understands that mind is insatiable. You can't get everlasting peace and happiness from the world. So he goes to this enlightened master. And he asks the master or oh master, I understand. I've experienced life. I've seen the world. I want to know something which is beyond this universe. And how do I get everlasting peace and happiness? And if there is God, if there is something beyond this world, what is it and how do I attain it? Now, you know, the word Upanishad, comprises three words, upa, ni, and shan. All this that I've spoken to you till now, of the qualified student, experienced student, matured person, understanding what is this world, and approaching the master, this is the meaning of the first letter upa in Upanishad. And to gain this maturity, sometimes it takes lifetime. So, upa means going to the teacher, approaching the teacher with this mature understanding. The, the word ni in Upanishad means nishtriya buddhi, a firm determination that I am going to learn this knowledge. I'm going to get it from the enlightened master. And I'm going to practice it. I'm not just going to take it. I'm going to practice it. And I'm going to realize the truth. I'm not going to leave any stone unturned. That firm determination to reach the goal is the meaning of me in Upanishad. And Shad means, it literally means sitting in front of the master. It's symbolic. It's indicative of one's attitude of humility and devotion. Letting go of your ego when you go to the master. If you go with the attitude, oh, well, I know everything. Uh, I'm, I'm so smart. I'm intellectual. But let me see what does this master have to say about, about life, about God. Well, if you go with that attitude, you're going to be at loss. So Upanishad, approaching the master with this mature outlook of life, going with that firm determination that I'm going to learn it, practice it, and come to experience it for myself, 
not just hear it, you know, lightly. And I'm going to go with devotion and humility. With the attitude that I don't know and I want to learn. So seeing such a mature, qualified student, then the master replies to this question of the student, that what is this universe all about? How to get everlasting happiness, peace? And who is God? Who are we? And the master replies, this is mantra one of the Isha Vase Upanishad. And it, as I said, it has it all. It says, Isha Vasyam Idam Sarva. The master replies, Om Isha Vasyam Idam Sarva. Yat Kincha Jagat Yam Jagat. Tena Tena Bunjitaha. Magrida Kasyasvitanam. It's a wonderful mantra. I would request you all to, to learn it by heart. So he says, Om Isha Vasamidam Sarvam Yat Kincha Jagat Yam Jagat. He says, Oh student, understand that this whole universe is nothing but God and God alone. Is nothing but consciousness and consciousness alone. I'm just translating. We'll, we'll, we'll go deep into every line of this mantra. So see the world as it is and not with your false vision. The false vision of plurality of divisions and distinction. May you give up, may you renounce your, your wrong thoughts about this world, your wrong understanding, your clinging attachment. May you understand the reality and by virtue of that, you'll be protected and you'll enjoy in this world. And finally, he says, Don't stress yourselves. Don't stress yourself. Don't be greedy. Don't be jealous of those who have more than you. Don't covet another person's wealth. Why? Because this whole universe is yours. It's, it's mind-boggling what this mantra is saying. So let's go deep into each and every line now. The first line reads, Om Isha Vasim Idam Sarvam Yat Jagatyam Jagat Yat Kinch Jagatyam Jagat He says this entire universe is pervaded by consciousness, is the consciousness that is you. And so see that, understand that, realize that. Now, let's understand this. Let's first understand who God is and who are we. When people refer to God, Ishwar, Allah, Jehovah, whatever you want to call that one entity, one supreme power. God refers to pure consciousness. Now, what is consciousness? See, we all are conscious, right? We all are aware. I hope so. I hope everybody is aware over here and listening to me attentively, not tentatively. So, it's consciousness. We experience consciousness. So, that Pure consciousness functioning through this total universe. Functioning through the total body. Total body meaning all the bodies and everything in this universe, whether living or non-living, moving or non-living, uh, non-moving. Everything, all our bodies, all our minds. So pure consciousness identifying, functioning through this entire universe is called God, that omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, loving Lord. 
In other words, Vedanta defines God as pure consciousness plus Maya. Maya meaning that the, the, the power of the Lord. That immense power of the Lord. It's inconceivable. We can't even think about that power. So pure consciousness plus Maya, referred to even as Shakti, is Ishwar, God. Now, the same pure consciousness functioning through this body, mind, and intellect, your body, mind, and intellect, my body, mind, the same pure consciousness identifying with each and every body, mind, and intellect is you and me, referred to as Jiva in Vedanta. I repeat, the same pure consciousness functioning through the entire universe is God. The same pure consciousness functioning through this body, mind, intellect is you and me, the jiva. So what's the point? What's the meeting point? What's the climax? The point over here is the same pure consciousness. When it comes from the standpoint of the pure consciousness, it's only one. God is, we are not different from God. We are one with God. It's not that the consciousness in us is different from the consciousness of God. The examples that are given is wave and ocean. A wave is small in size. It's got a particular shape. But the ocean is huge. Immense power. But from the standpoint of the water, there's absolutely no difference. When the wave merges back in the ocean, can you say, oh, that's the wave that merged back in the ocean? No, it's one. Right? Another example is that of, you know, bulbs and electricity. A 10-watt bulb can hardly illumine this room. Whereas a 1,000-watt floodlight can light up a big stadium. But the electricity is the same in both. The difference is in the material equipment, in the bulbs, in the matter vestures. Similarly, the difference between us and God is our matter vestures. He's, he's omnipotent. He's omniscient. Our body, mind, and intellect is limited. Right? But if we let go of these material equipments, if we keep and all these material equipments our body, mind, intellect, and the powers of God, all this falls in the category of Maya. If we keep that Maya aside, Maya is also referred to as name and form, Nama Rupa. If we keep that aside, there's, there's virtually no difference between us and God. We are one with God. We are that one homogeneous mass of consciousness. It's mind-boggling. That's the ultimate truth. So the ultimate reality declared by all the Upanishads, by all Vedanta and by all masters from time immemorial is Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya and Jiva Brahmaiva Napara. Meaning this whole universe is a mere appearance. It's an illusion. I'm sorry to say the truth. It's a mere appearance, it's an illusion, and the reality behind this changing universe is that one consciousness, and that consciousness is who? It's you. You are that all-pervading consciousness. Only if you can understand how profound this statement is. It should give you goosebumps. Each time we hear Aham Brahmasmi, Tattva Masi, it should make a hair stand on end. So not only are you consciousness, but this entire universe is a manifestation of you. And, and just see the beauty of nature or God that it reminds us every day, every day it reminds us of this truth. Because we might wonder, how is that possible? How is it possible that this entire, you know, this pluralistic phenomenon 
different beings, human beings, animals, the plant kingdom, the, the, the earth, the stars, the whole universe. I mean, it's mind-boggling if you see the pictures that the new telescope is sending us, the James Webb telescope, the galaxies, how vast the universe is. And what this mantra is saying is that all that is an appearance in you, the consciousness. You are that substratum. So God or nature reminds us of this reality every day of our life. And that beautiful example that God and nature gives us is in the form of, of our dream. Now, follow, I'm, I'm sure many of you would have heard this before, but if we, if we remind ourselves of this example every day, it's, it's mind-boggling. That's why masters recommend that when you wake up in the morning, just spend a minute and just analyze and just thinking that just a few minutes ago you were in that dream. But, that, but when you were in that dream world, it was as real as this waking world for you. So when we are in that dream world as dreamers, mind you, when we are in that dream state of consciousness, we don't know it's a dream. We don't know it's an illusion. For us, it's real. Your relatives, your friends, your foes, your enemies, and the world that you're experiencing, the sun, the moon, the stars, the fauna, the flora, is as real as this waking world. It's only when you wake up, you realize that, my God, that that mind of yours, one ray, one thought ray became you yourself, the dreamer. Another ray of the mind became your spouse or your family member, your children, the universe, the fauna, the flora, the stars, the moon, the sun. It was all one mind. Can you believe that? Similarly, what the masters are saying is that's exactly what we're experiencing in this waking world. Just as that one waker's mind became that entire dream world, which was real for you as long as you were in that dream, this waking world is a manifestation, is a projection of that one consciousness. And that consciousness is you. You, please don't forget that. So this waking world is also another appearance, another illusion like the dream. But mind you, let me tell you, though we are caught up, as long as we are caught up in this illusion, please let's follow the rules of the game. We, are, we can't act funny. You know, there's the law of karma, the law of causation functioning in this world. So if we just say, oh, it's an illusion and we start walking in the middle of the road and a bus comes over us, then please. <laughs> so we got to we got to follow the rules of the game. It's only when you go to the next state of consciousness, that is when you gain enlightenment, you can clearly see that this waking world also is another illusion, is another appearance. So this is the ultimate reality that all the Upanishads, all the masters from time immemorial have been shouting their lungs out from the rooftops. Lord Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. The Old Testament, the voice of the Old Testament, yes. the voice of God, I am that I am, I am that I am, that I am. That I am is that pure consciousness pervading the entire universe. Prophet Muhammad in the Quran says, the greatest jihad is that of the conquest of the self. Guru Nanak in Guru Granth Sahib says, Ik Omkar Satnam Karta Puruk. He starts the Guru Granth Sahib with that ultimate reality. And Lord Krishna says in the Gita, I am the self in all. I am you and you are me. I'm not different from you. The Upanishads declare, Tattva Masi. You are that supreme, indivisible, absolute, pure consciousness. You are limitless awareness. 
And what do we think of ourselves to be? This finite body, mind, and intellect. Hanta, Hanta says the Upanishads. It's so sad. Even quantum physics, quantum science is indicating the same truth today. Saying that everything is consciousness. And that consciousness is you. You are Brahman. You are one with God. So this first line of this mantra is saying that this entire universe of time, space and causa causation is nothing but a projection of that one consciousness that you are. So the point is don't get caught up in this, in this illusion, in this, in this phenomenon of names and forms. It's all names and forms. Don't get attached to this illusion. The problem with us, see, you see, all of our problems in the world is name and form. It's with other beings or with objects. We like some, we dislike some. It's all to do with name and form. We get entangled and meshed in names and forms, in Dhamma and Rupa and Maya. And we are buffeted by them. That's why that Hindi Bollywood song, Kabi Kushi Kabi Gam. We are tossed between the pairs of opposites, honor and dishonor, joy and sorrow. And the irony is that what we dislike, what we want to avoid is what comes in front of us again and again. The people who we want to maintain distance from is who, who, who come in front of us. The, the circumstances who we, that we want to avoid come in front of us. So the whole point is rising above these pairs of opposites and being happy always. So the point is changing our focus, changing our vision from our likes and dislikes to the vision of God, to the vision of the pure consciousness everywhere and everything. But the practical spirituality that we all experience, unfortunately, is God is everywhere but I see him nowhere, right? Now, let's experience this pure consciousness. Let's just have a glimpse of this pure consciousness right now and here. It's a small thought experiment so that we understand, we're on the same page, we understand what are we talking about. I'm sure most of you are, uh, you know, a matured spiritual audience, but just to have a glimpse so you can do this little thought experiment with me. You can, I would request you all to just close your eyes, gently close your eyes. Now we've closed our eyes. We can't see, but aren't we there? Yes, we're there as the, as the awareness, as the pure consciousness, we're there. Imagine all your sensory perceptions cease. They come to an end. You can't hear, you can't smell, you can't touch, you can't feel. I please strongly visualize and imagine this, that all your sensory perceptions have gone. Aren't you still there? Yes, we're still there. We can't see, we can't hear, we can't smell, we can't touch, we can't taste, but still I'm there. You can feel. You're, you're, you're witnessing your emotions now. You're, you're, you're witnessing your thoughts now. Imagine even that goes away. You're, you have no mind. You have no thoughts, no memories. All your past memories is washed away. Aren't you still there? Yes, we're still there. As the pure consciousness, as the pure awareness. No body, no mind, no intellect, no memories. We're still there. Pure consciousness is that which has never taken birth and shall never die. This, this is what we are experiencing right now. You can gently open your eyes. Now, what we all experience, that pure awareness, without this body, mind and intellect, is not confined to within you. 
Yes, you experience it within you. But that same pure consciousness, which is your substratum, is the substratum of this entire universe. So it's not within you. In fact, you and this entire universe is in that consciousness. So this consciousness that you all experience is that all-pervading consciousness. It's within and without. Imminent and transitive. Mind-boggling. It's your limitless awareness. So, and this is what we should come to realize, come to experience with our eyes closed or with our eyes open when we are interacting in the world. This is what enlightened masters experience. Sometimes we wonder what, what was Lord Buddha's vision? What was Swami Vivekananda's vision? What is the vision of enlightened masters? Just to get a glimpse of it is, you know, now I give you that dream example. Imagine when you wake up from a dream and imagine if you were given a passport, if you could re-enter the erstwhile dream, but with the full awareness that, hey, that's an illusion. And you are the waker, and you're re-entering that dream. Now, how will you go on in that dream state? With that full awareness, with that enlightenment, that look here, yeah, it's an appearance, it's an illusion. You will meet the same people in that dream, your relatives, your friends, your foes. You'll see the same fauna and flora, the sun, the moon, the planets, the stars. But you will understand that it's an appearance. And the reality is the waker. That's exactly the experience of enlightened people. They, 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 they can clearly see, they experience the world just as we, we are doing, but they are enlightened that they are that pure consciousness in and through, reflecting in and through this universe. So, then coming to the next line of this mantra. And it says, Tena Tyaktena Bunjita. Understanding that you are that pure consciousness, give up this false notion that this universe is real and everybody are different. There's a pluralistic phenomena. Give up this clinging attachment this self-centered attachment and live life from the standpoint of that pure consciousness. It's a paradigm shift in our thinking. He says, Tena tena bunjitaha. May you renounce this false notion and protect yourself with this knowledge and enjoy the world. So when he says renounce, it's not, you don't have to give up anything in the world. You, you can be in this world. You, you'll be continuing with whatever you're doing. Your, your personal life, your professional life, whatever you're doing. You don't have to give up your family, your home, your position. All that you're giving up is your self-centered attachment, your possessive attitude. So you'll be living in the same world. You'll be living in your own home, your family, enjoying it, but with that understanding that you are that all-pervading consciousness. There's this beautiful story of this great sage, Brahaspati, an enlightened master, and his son was Kutch. So the story goes that Kutch, his son, he finished his education he learned all the knowledge. And he came back to his father after, after his education. And the father asked him, Hey, Kutch, you finished your education. Have you attained peace? Have you attained that ultimate happiness and peace? And Kutch was like, No, I've, I've, I've studied everything. I've studied the Vedas, I've studied Vedanta, I've studied everything secular knowledge and spiritual knowledge, but I'm not attained real peace and happiness. 
And the father, the great sage Brahaswati said, it is through renunciation that you will attain peace and happiness. And Gach was like, oh, okay. Tyag, renunciation. So he said, okay. He put on orca robes. He just took a staff and his bowl, or the, the, the food bowl. And he went out to the different pilgrims of our country. Uh, he was on arms begging for food. He renounced. So after one year, he comes back to his father. And the father asks him, have you attained peace? He says, father, I've renounced everything. But no, I've not still attained peace and happiness. And the father said, through renunciation, you'll gain happiness and peace. He said, what more do I renounce? Okay, I think so. My father is saying, give up everything. So he even gave up his staff, his begging bowl. Uh, he said, okay, if I get food, if God gives me food, I'll have it. If not, it's okay. He even renounced his clothes and like a Digambara Swami, he started roaming, going to pilgrims. And then he came back after a year. And the father asked him the same question. So have you attained peace and happiness? He said, no, I'm not. And the father said again, through renunciation. He said, what else should I give? I've given up everything. Maybe my father is saying I should give up this body. So he lit, lit up a bonfire and he was about to jump in the fire and the father came. He says, oh, Kach, what are you doing? By just committing suicide, burning your body, your mind, your subtle body is going to go to another body. That's not peace and happiness. So he says, father, then what is renunciation? He said, yet you should have asked that question at the very beginning. You assumed, assumed your own meanings of renunciation and you went about and then the father explained, renunciation is not renunciation of this body. It's the renunciation of the mind. It's that notion that I am this mind, this intellect, these, these emotions, these thoughts. The father said, renounce that and take up your higher nature that you are that all-pervading consciousness. Because it is this in this mind and intellect that the the pure consciousness gets entangled, enmeshed in, in, in its samsara, in its attachment. So to this mind, we have to say, look, yeah, I'm not this mind, and this mind is not mine. I am that all-pervading consciousness. I am one with God. And then when Kutch implemented this, he attained the highest peace and happiness. So renunciation is not giving up, it's taking up. Automatically, the lower, lower values will fall off. You know, as children, we were attached to toys and trinkets. But when we grew up, we automatically renounced those toys and trinkets because we matured to a higher state of understanding. Similarly, in spirituality, when you take up the higher, automatically the lower falls off. Renunciation is not giving up your home, your family, your children, your money. No, it's just giving up that possessive attitude, that clinging attachment. Live in the world as the pure consciousness and go about your life. That's about all. So, tena keptena bunjita. May you go on in this world as that all pervading pure consciousness and enjoy this world. And finally, Finally comes the last line of this mantra, which says, Magrida Kasyas Vidhan. The master says, Magrida Kasyas Magrida meaning, don't be stressed. Why are you stressing yourself? Stress is nothing but mental agitations caused because of our unfulfilled desires. It is the mind that's pitching up desires, 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 self-centered desires for the objects and beings of this world. And it's stress. I don't have this. I don't have that. This person is doing this with me. That person is doing that with me. So, Magrida, don't be stressed. Don't covet another's, another's wealth. Don't be greedy. Don't be jealous of those who have more than you. When we see people who are more than us, we are envious, we are jealous. 
And he says, Mark the Kashis with them. Don't covet another's wealth. You know why? Because this entire universe belongs to you. This entire universe is you. So what are you fretting and fuming about? As this pure consciousness, you you own this entire world. You see, it's what the master is saying is, imagine as parents, imagine a father. He buys a small car for his three, uh, three or four-year-old child, a small car, you know, the toy. As children, as small boys, we were so attracted to those racing cars. And the father buys that car for that little boy. And that little child is enjoying with that car, zoom, zoom. And imagine the father, for some funny reason, he forgets who he is. He forgets that he's the owner, he's the father. It is he, with his money, that he's bought that little toy. He's forgotten all that, and he gets attracted to that little toy. And he's running after it, and he's trying to covet it from his son. Absurd, isn't it? Or imagine a mother who buys a beautiful doll for her daughter, a three, four-year-old daughter. Beautiful, cute doll, and the little child is playing, and she forgets who she is, that she has bought the doll, and now she's going to covet that little doll. That's exactly what we are doing in this universe. That's exactly what this last line is saying. Margrida Kasyus within of this whole universe is yours, is you. What are you fretting and fuming for these little things here and there? You see, we'll, we'll, we'll end this session with a beautiful story. And I want you all to remember this story every day of your lives. Some would have already heard this story. But it's a good reminder. Honestly, I remind myself, I remind myself of the story every day. It's so potent. It's so powerful. It gives me goosebumps each time I think about this example. It's a funny story, but it drives home the point. The story is called The Princess of Manipura. Now, I hope you all remember our friend Arjuna, Arjuna in the Gita. So when Arjuna was a four-year-old boy, a small boy, there was a drama, a play that was happening in the palace. Everybody were there, Kunti, even Krishna was there. And the play was around this little princess, the princess of Manipura. The role of this princess of Manipura was also a little girl in that play. And it so happened that that day, this little girl who had to play the role of the princess of Manipura, she fell ill and she couldn't come. Now, everybody worried now, the whole thing depends on this little girl. It's, the whole drama is circling around this little girl and she's not come. How will it go? Then Kunti said that, look here, Arjuna, is of the same age and he's so cute. Just dress him up as a princess. Disguise him as a princess. And they said, oh wow, that's a wonderful idea. So they disguised the little Arjuna as the princess of Manipura. And Arjuna was looking so beautiful, so attractive. A real princess, little princess. And the play went on, everything went on fine. Everybody was appreciating how beautiful Arjuna was looking. And so they suggest, even Kunti said, okay, call the, 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 the painter, the court painter, and make a painting of Arjuna, that little princess of Manipura. And the, the painter came and he drew a beautiful portrait, a beautiful picture, just as how Arjuna was looking. And uh, Kunti told the painter, write the date, write the date, and write Princess of Manipur. Fine. And that was kept nicely in the in the storeroom, in the cellar, in the basement. Now, time passed, time flew, 20 years down the line. Fast forward to 20 years later, and Arjuna was a young prince now. 
25 years old. And he forgot. He forgot that there was this drama and all. He was a four-year-old uh, kid. So, and he was doing his princely duties and all going about, became a great prince, a great archer. So one day when he was down in the basement, in the cellar, in the storeroom, he, he was just looking for something and he came across this portrait. And he opened it and he says, wow, Princess of Moneybrook, so beautiful. And he sees the date and he's like, wow, that's my age. And he falls in love with Princess of Manipur. <laughs> right? He's madly in love with the Princess of Manipur. He's forgotten. He doesn't know that <laughs> it was him who was disguised. And he's madly in love. And he's like, he's made a resort. If I, I'm going to get mad at this princess. And somehow he feels shy telling it to his brothers, his mother. And He's just thinking about the princess of Manipura day and night, you know, becomes Devdas. And uh, his brothers, Yudhishthir Bhim, Kunti is saying, what's happened to Arjuna? What's, he's giving up his obligations and why is he sad and all? So, and he's not opening up, he's feeling shy. And then Yudhishthir said that I, the best thing is to call Krishna. Because this guy, Arjuna, is very close to Krishna. You know, the relationship between Krishna and Arjuna was, they were cousins, but it was more of, you know, friends. They were very open to each other. So Lord Krishna was called and Lord Krishna, <laughs> he knew everything. So he came and he sees Arjuna in this state. So Yudhishthira explains to Krishna, this, says, see, what's the matter? What's gone wrong with this guy? Why has he become Devdas? So then they were walking. He, Arjuna and Krishna were walking in the garden. Krishna said, oh, what happened, Arjuna? You don't seem to be fine. Any, everything fine? What's bothering you? Are you sorrowful? And Arjuna said, finally he opened up. He said, Krishna, you know, I just open up to you. I tell you everything. You know what? I'm in love. I'm in love. And Krishna said, oh, wow, that's wonderful. What's wrong with that? You should have told your brothers, your mother, they would be happy or uh, marriageable age. And, uh, wonderful. So who's the lucky one? And he's like, the princess of Manipura. Krishna was like, okay. So, he says, so where did you meet her? He says, no, 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 I've not met her. I've seen her photo, a picture. A picture. Okay, where is the photo? Where, where's the photo? It's down in the cell in the basement. Come, come, Krishna, I'll show you. And he takes Krishna to the storeroom, carefully takes out the portrait, and he opens and he says, Krishna, princess of Manipura. And she sees the age, see the date, she's my age. I'm just going to get married to her. And Krishna was like, he knew because he was also present, he, he, he remembered it. And of course, he's Antaryami, he's the Lord. So he's like, Arjuna. We got to sit down. We, we got to sit down. Chillax. Ha, ha, have some water. And he makes Arjuna sit down and he says, Arjuna, please, this what you're seeing is no princess. And Arjuna is like, oh, it's okay. But even if she's not a princess, I'm going to get married to her. She's so beautiful. Ar Krishna is like, hey, Arjuna, forget being a princess. She's not even a girl. And Arjuna is like, what? Not even a girl? What are you talking about? That's why I didn't want to tell everybody. This is Krishna. I didn't want to tell you about it. I know you would also make fun. And Krishna told him, Arjuna, please understand what you are seeing, what you fall in love with is you. Tatwa Masi. You are the princess of Manipura. It's not different from you. And he reminds of Arjuna that there was a play uh, 21 years ago. You were, she didn't come and to disguise you and you are this beautiful.
what are you running about? You're fretting and fuming about what? Just as a father going behind that little toy which belongs to him only. Now let me let you all into a secret. How to apply this in our lives. See, when it comes to those objects and beings in this world that attract us, we can tell ourselves, we got to tell our mind that that object and being that you're after, that you're running after is you. It's the pure consciousness. So that that pull will come, will go less. That attraction will go less. We automatically develop a sense of vairagya because we know it's us only. And for those objects and beings that repel us, that we don't like, that we want to maintain a distance from, and rightfully so, maybe somebody has really hurt you in life, has cheated you, has abused you, has done wrong with you, and you want to avoid that person. Apply this, the, the, that other value that that person or that object that being does not really exist. It's it's phantasm. It's it's an illusion. Just as the princess of Manipura is an illusion. It's just an appearance. It does not exist. Similarly, those objects and things that you do not like want to maintain it. It's just wipe them off from your mind. See, the whole point over here is to shift your focus from the objects and beings of this universe to your higher nature and not get attached. See, attachment is both. It's likes and dislikes. What you like and what you dislike. So for those objects and beings, apply the principle that it's me. And those objects and beings that you don't like, apply the principle. They don't really exist. It's an illusion. Don't give importance to them. Right? The whole point is shifting your awareness from your body, mind, and intellect from the from this world to God, to your higher nature, to the pure consciousness. That is the meaning of Upanishads. That's the meaning of this first mantra. Om Isha Vasim. I'm summarizing. I'm concluding. Om Isha Vasim Idam Sarvam. Yat Kit Chit Jagat Yam Jagat. This entire universe is a manifestation of God, that is your higher self, of the consciousness. Give up the false notion that it's a pluralistic phenomenon. Give up your clinging attachment, your self-centered false notion. You don't have to leave this world, enjoy this world. Just give up the false notion, the false idea. That this universe is separate from you. And finally, the kasyas with the mouth. Don't be stressed out. Don't covet another's wealth. Don't feel jealous. Don't be greedy. The mind is insatiable. Kasyas with the The whole universe is yours. You know, Lord Krishna, the Bala Krishna, the baby Krishna, we see his photo. He's sucking his own thumb. He's sucking his own toe. Right? As a child also, he's educating us. Isn't it absurd? He's sucking his own toe and he's gaining pleasure out of it. That's the same thing with us. We, the pure consciousness, we are the pure consciousness and the universe is also the pure consciousness. So one part of the, one part is quoting another part. You're running after your own self and you're trying to gain pleasure, which is accompanied by sorrow. That's absurd, isn't it? You're quoting your own self. It's you. It's you everywhere. Just as Lord Krishna sucking his own toe. That's the lesson that Lord Krishna is giving us. Don't, don't, don't do this foolishness of fretting and fuming and getting stressed. Enjoy. Be, be blissful. Understand. And this pure consciousness is referred to as Satchit Ananda. Existence, consciousness, bliss. It's existence. It's, it never dies because it's never born. It's full of awareness. It's limitless awareness. And it's ananda. It's bliss. Why? Because we're not confined to this body, mind, and intellect. We are, we are, we're all pervading. We're infinite. You see, if somebody puts you in the jail, you feel sad, right? Because then you're in the jail. You're not free. Similarly, at present, we are in, this, the, in the jail of this body, mind, and intellect because of our wrong notion. When we realize that we are that infinite consciousness, we're free. And hence, blissful. When we are infinite, when there's no bondages, we are blissful. 
That's the meaning of this mantra. That's the meaning of all the Upanishads. Tattvamasi. Understand that you are Brahman. You are pure consciousness. You are one with God. Realize that and enjoy this world. Right? We conclude over here. We can take up any question answer session if you have any questions. Yes, now I have given the option. Yes, yes, now I can speak. Okay, thank you so much, Rishi. That was really wonderful. That uh, one stanza that you took from Isha Upanishad 